coming up on Caffeinated Theology. So somebody was asked me, and said, well, Pastor, how old do you think the age of the earth, how old is the earth? So we reflect God uh, in that way um, through, through creativity. He says, I believe Genesis 1 and 2 teach that God created the whole universe during a time which the writer calls the beginning. More of a practical home supermarket being discussing theological truths for biblical living, reviewing featured coffee roast and premium brewing techniques. This is the Caffeinated Theology Podcast, bringing you biblical truths over a fine cup of coffee. All right, Caffeinated Theology, episode number six. Today we're going to discuss a much debated topic uh, in the world today, and that is on creation. And we'll talk, of course, or discuss on evolution a bit as well. I don't think that you can talk about creation without speaking about evolution as well. Those two are highly debated today. We're going to try to discuss some motives behind creationism and evolution, and we'll answer a few questions along the way. So last week we were able to discuss the validity of the scriptures. We began this journey just a few episodes back, and really a Journey in theology isn't just ascribed to a few days. It takes a lifetime to study the precepts and disciplines in in theology. But we we figured that if we're going to continue our discussion somewhere along the way, we have to give a defense to the Word of God and the validity of Scripture. Is the Bible trustworthy? Is it authoritative? And so last episode, episode number five, uh, was on the scriptures. Any takeaway from last week on on the scriptures? And maybe some viewers might not know what to expect and maybe want to go back and listen to that. Yeah, you know, uh, the scriptures and, and knowing why we believe the scriptures are accurate and trustworthy is really a uh, foundational point of theology. Um. You know, everything that we've done up to now and moving forward in this podcast uh, is based on the Scripture. Mm -hmm. So uh, for a Christ follower, uh, particularly if you're going to be talking to other folks about about the gospel, and in in this day and age we live when um, everybody questions everything, uh, we we need to have a good uh, understanding of why we trust Mm -hmm. God's word, and, and I feel like we we kind of gave a good uh, overview of that last week. Um, gave some resources, further resources to get an even better understanding of that. So I think that's something. Uh, even maybe from time to time, we'll come back to yes. just because you know the authority of God's word is so important when discussing theology. Yeah, so an important um, most of. The average congregation trusts in the validity of Scripture, at least orthodox, from an orthodox view. But we also want to lay some foundation for um, furthering conversation if we're speaking to somebody who might be a little skeptical about the Word. We'll always end up coming to that that crossroad of defending the authority of the Bible with some reasonable sources uh, to consider. Uh, and and by the way, last episode, episode number five on scriptures was a little lengthy, but uh, it was a needed uh, a needed discussion. And so uh, hopefully you'll be able to enjoy that. It's around an hour and 45 minutes, but it's it's got some good content, especially for uh, for the church, which is what this podcast is for, is theology uh, for practical purposes. Uh, for the church and to help us navigate through some reasonable accounts of of, of how we get the Bible. So, how about the brew last um, last week? Maybe 
uh, the Jake give us Brew. A, yeah, the Jake yeah. Brew. Um, well, it was good to have uh, Jason White as a guest last week, and uh, we don't have a, a guest today. Uh, Lloyd should be with us next week again, so we look forward to seeing him. But the brew mm-hmm. last week, Jason brought his Whirly Pop uh, roaster. Um, right. And I was uh, so intrigued by that mm. that I have bought a Whirly Pop. And, oh yeah, yeah. And have uh, <laughs> have the parts on order to build my own. But uh, oh, yeah, it maybe. was it was just a, a cool little change to be able to roast our own coffee. And he brought a uh, a little sample of coffee that he had roasted, and that's what we reviewed last week. Mm-hmm. But I will say uh, the beans we roasted here that we featured on, on the podcast last week after they had conditioned for about 24 to 48 hours. Well, they were really, really good. Yeah. Uh, the ones he brought, he, he said they were a little bit over mm-hmm. a week old. Right. I mean, they were good, but that 24 hour period, I mean, they were, mm-hmm. they were really fantastic. Yeah. So w- we might feature that of, on one uh, episode in the future, you know, kind of take the things we kind of learned from, Jason White and 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 do a podcast amongst ourselves. Well, Jason Tate will uh, uh, roast some beans, and we'll yeah. I'll, I'll, when I get all of the parts in, I'll document uh, putting together mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. the whole the whole uh, yeah. setup. So yeah, and so we're thinking um, somewhere along the, down the line, we're gonna we're gonna still do the mystery choice. Just kind of go in a supermarket and pick a. A random bag of whole bean and and uh, and see if we can you know see how it tastes and review that. Uh, today we're going to be reviewing very simple brew, uh, very simple blend, which is uh, Dunkin' Donuts. So from this point on, we've kind of been highlighting some premium uh, premium beans, uh, premium roasts, and we wanted to kind of go back a little bit to a more practical in your home kind of, uh, uh, blend. And so that's why we're going to, we're going to be sampling a Dunkin' Donuts original blend today. Uh, we're going to be using the AeroPress as well. We'll have that a little bit, um, uh, in a little bit uh, to come. So stay tuned for that as well. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about creation in the sense of the age of the earth. Let's, uh, let's do that. Okay, so let's begin a discussion about creation. Of course, we are approaching it from the biblical account creation and not simply from an intelligent design factor. We talked about intelligent design when we spoke about the, the arguments for the existence of God, specifically the teleological argument, that from design. So today we're coming from it from a strictly biblical worldview, but we'll also we'll talk a little bit, we'll discuss about uh, evolution and the implications of an evolutionary process, if indeed that is truth, uh, the implications of that for, for the church. So, Jason, I'm going to ask you, how old do you think the earth is? You know, that's a... Uh... <laughs> A question that's much debated, and uh, I I tend to fall on a more young Earth than older Earth, but I I would say as far as like my confidence in that is definitely uh, uh, I wouldn't say like concrete. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm definitely open to to debate mm-hmm. on the age of the Earth. Um, I tend to definitely, I mean, I definitely don't think the earth is millions or billions Mm -hmm. of years old. I just, uh, I don't fall under that camp, but I don't know if I would say it's Mm -hmm. six, seven, 9,000 years old either, which, which is kind of the other, um, I don't know if I would say extreme because I would definitely lean more that way than, than toward Mm -hmm. the, the really, really old extreme, but, uh, what kind of. You know, definitely closer to yeah. a younger, younger Earth. Yeah, I think what we will mo- more than likely propose for this particular podcast will be that the age of the Earth is something that we absolutely 
have a difficult time navigating through, meaning the Bible is not particularly specific on the number of years because the Bible is not trying to give us a date for the age of the earth. If that was the case, the Lord would have given a, give us the age of uh, the age of the earth. And the same thing goes for science or evolution. Again, we're not pitting evo- uh, science and the Bible against one another, but evolution would purport that the earth is somewhere around 4.7 billion years old. And they simply don't have the empirical evidence to support that yeah. either. Yeah, I think... Uh I can't remember if it was when uh, Ken Ham debated Bill Nye, or I have a, a, a study for students called "Demolishing Strongholds" that uh, Bill Nye does a couple of segments. I'm not Bill Nye, uh, Ken Ham does a couple of segments, and I think it's in the "Demolishing Strongholds," um, where he talks about when you discuss origins. Right. Um, when you get mm-hmm. to a certain point, going backwards, everything mm-hmm. is an assumption. We don't have right. uh, um, people who uh, wrote it down uh, and you know, give us a concrete history mm-hmm. of what happened. So um, that's one thing when we're yeah. talking about creation is um, using reason, reasoning and logic and God's Word to, right. to talk about where everything came from. <laughs> right. So somebody was, asked me, uh, was to ask me as a pastor and say, well, Pastor, how old do you think the age of the earth, how old is the earth? Um, and my short answer to it would be, well, I don't know, and neither do you. We have a good idea. Yes, it's an assumption, and yeah. and kind of what I I think what I want to get across with that is um, when you're talking to the skeptic community, uh, you know, they have no mm-hmm. problem saying, well, you're using the Bible mm-hmm. uh, to to prove to be your proof text to to be where you're getting your beliefs from. And to that, I would say absolutely. Um, but you have uh, no more concrete evidence, tangible right. evidence, with with whatever um, line of thought or method you're using yeah. to uh, mm-hmm. to get your um, ideas as well. So mm-hmm. um, when you when you really, like I said, when you really think about where people's ideas of, of origins and creation come right. from, um, it's all based off of assumption. Yeah. And we have a recorded record, which we talked about mm-hmm. last week, why we think that's reliable yeah. um, in, in the Scriptures. Yeah, there is a, a bit of contention, even amongst evangelicals or uh, Christ followers, uh, th- even theists, about the age of the earth. And the question, I think, for... Uh, again, these are practical matters for the church. So does it matter if we ascribe an age... Uh, to the earth does it does it matter it matters to the point when we are at war if you will spiritually uh, with uh, another side that is trying to undermine the authority of God and then we can say we know that God created but we simply don't have a date and for the evolutionary process you don't have a date either but what does it matter Um, what does it matter you know, that, or does it matter if, you know, there's no specific age of the earth given? And, and really, I think, I think at the end of the day, it, it, it's not a matter of great importance, because if it was, then God would have given us an exact, an exact day. And we'll talk a little bit about the age of the earth, and when we, uh, we'll further the discussion a little bit when we when we talk about what is called historical creationism, uh, we'll talk about that in in a moment. Yeah, you know, I think I think sometimes some of these uh, debates in certain theological topics where the Bible is um, unclear, um, sometimes we'll spin our wheels on those things uh, mm-hmm. when maybe we really shouldn't. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I don't know if I'd go as far as say, as to say the enemy distracts us with those things mm-hmm. to keep us from from doing. Uh, uh, what we should be doing as Christ followers, maybe. Um, but there are definitely some aspects mm-hmm. of creation um, beyond just how old the earth is right. that are important to understand mm-hmm. as a Christ follower. Um, and we'll get to those um, as yeah, we move right, forward. Right, right. 
So um, the, the reasoning, I think, that we come down to, to saying that it, as far as the age of the earth, it might be a tertiary matter or one of not as first order, if you will, such as the substitutionary atonement or something like that, is simply because the Bible is not a book of science. Uh, can we imply some things from the Bible and add to science? Sure. The Bible is primarily not a book of history, unless, of course, you're talking about the Hebrew origin, uh, the Hebrew nation that brings forth Messiah. But the Bible is not a prime; it's not a book of science. It's not a historical. You know, it is. It contains history. It's primarily God's redemptive story. This is how man might become in God's good graces through His Son. That is what the Bible is about. It's not projecting creationism. It's not projecting uh, historical, you know, it, although it does give history. The, the Bible is not those two things primarily. And so if the Bible aren't those two things, why do we elevate it to a place to try to answer all of science's questions and all of history's questions? And I think really behind that is what we talked about last week is trusting the validity and authority of Scripture that it does speak to every area of our life um, or implies in every area of our life, but there are some details that God just has not given to us. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> and that's okay. That's fine. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think the Bible stands up to uh, scientific scrutiny mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, using logic and reasoning and, and scrutinizing the Bible, it stands up to it. But mm -hmm. as you said, it's not that's not its primary purpose. All right. So the question of creation is with Genesis one, chapter one and chapter two. And we'll speak a, on that topic a little bit further in detail. But first thing I wanted to discuss a little was this idea of God and his creative power. When, when we, uh, as theologians, uh, pastors, teachers, when we teach on creation, uh, one of the things that we would like to highlight every time that we talk about creation is this concept of ex nihilo, or ex nihilo, ever how, you, ever how fresh your Latin might be. Uh, it actually comes from a word meaning coming from nothing. Uh, so God created from nothing. And this comes from Genesis 1 and verse 1. And that reads, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So that idea of created there is the sense of this ex nihilo, meaning out of nothing. And this word is very interesting. We'll talk about this word now, uh, the word for created. This word for created is bara in the Hebrew, and it is only used when you're talking about a divine act of God in creation, meaning that this is something that only God can do, God can create. And so that word is bara in the, in the Hebrew. And it does not imply or mean that God took other uh, elements and molded them together that already existed. Uh, God didn't take you know something from over here and over here and some elements and molded them together that was already there. God created; He spoke it into existence. Uh, this is contrary to, let's say, Greek mythology or even the later adopted Roman mythology that would say that there were other small g gods that created this world that we see from other uh, elements in the universe and molded it together. Uh, so Christians actually believe that God is the author of creation itself and created just by His Word. Yeah, uh, I re remember a uh, hearing a, a speaker one time uh, kind of use an anthropomorphic way to describe this mm -hmm. um, of God creating just by by His the authority of His um, command, mm -hmm. um, He said. You know, he talked about when uh, when God uh, said, "Let there be light." Light. The way He kind of put yeah. it was, light came mm -hmm. flying out of the mouth of God, 
um, at the speed of light and just existed. You're trying to understand. And trying to understand yeah. it uh, in a way that our minds can can wrap around that, you know, uh, an anthropomorphic right. way of, of attributing mm-hmm. like a human characteristic of seeing God speak mm. uh speak light into existence and just to, to kind of express that uh, ex nihilo idea of he didn't use something that already existed to make that light. It just came literally from his command. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's good. And where we find that at, uh, is, as Jason has mentioned uh, in Genesis 1 verse 3, this is the act of ex nihilo that we first see this that where where God said, "Let there be light," and that's the first place that we see this. And then the Bible says that God separated light from the darkness. And it, so, uh, also another verse that we find is uh, Hebrews eleven verse three that says, "By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things that were and are seen." were not made of things which are visible. And so this is this idea of God creating from nothing. Now, that's difficult for us to get our heads around because uh, we are accustomed always to having something uh, rather than nothing. We, we spoke about this when we, talked of, when we spoke about um, the cosmological argument and trying to understand cause and effect, that there had to be an unmoved mover, something that moved first. The same could be said for creation, because we can't get our mind around this idea of there being nothing and then an infinite, powerful being speaking, and then it comes into existence. And I think that helps lay validity to the creation narrative we find in Genesis 1 and also Genesis chapter 2. But let's, let's think a little bit about this creative power. So Genesis 1.26 said we were made in the image and likeness of God. So how are humans, in, if they're made in the image of God, how do we find uh, this creativity in humankind? Well, you know, we, we reflect God's uh, image by having a creative nature ourselves. Uh, mm-hmm. we, you know, we love to... Um, create art. Uh, right. we, I think almost everybody loves some sort of music. Uh, and mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's a form of, of creative, um, uh, a creative aspect of ourselves of, of making music mm-hmm. um, from, it's not really ex nihilo uh, because, you know, we take, we have to have, we take music yeah. notes and mm-hmm. uh, put them together. But you know, before somebody writes a song, um, that song didn't exist, so we kind of create the ideas of music. Uh, somebody maybe puts paint mm-hmm. to a canvas and, and, and creates a uh, beautiful mm-hmm. picture. Um, so we reflect God uh, in that way um, through through creativity. Uh, one thing I always uh, stress, um, and this is more evangelistic, uh, but when I talk about bearing the image of God, uh, you know, we know God as, as being eternal, Mm-hmm. And one way we reflect uh, his image is, you know, when our bodies wear out and we die, our soul will will last mm-hmm. and will remain. And you know that the implications of that are, are huge. Uh, we have to answer uh, answer what happens to our souls. And as you said earlier, um, the scripture is primarily um, a a book about uh, the redemptive work. Right. of God to humanity, and it, it mm-hmm. answers that question of what happens to our soul. And we know that to be uh, you know, on our own, uh, which, which you'll see in two chapters later right. in Genesis 3, yeah. we're separated from God mm-hmm. because of sin, and yeah. um, the rest of the Bible is about uh, Christ coming yeah. to redeem us. Yeah. So, you know, that's one way that we reflect God as well, and mm-hmm. I, th- I think we, we would be amiss if we failed to mention that uh, yes. we reflect God's image mm-hmm. by um, our souls existing, um, at least forwardly eternal, and uh, and answering answering right. that. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Doesn't take <laughs> doesn't take very long uh, in the creation account and to the introduction of man into the creation narrative to find that um, it's just two chapters in. The third chapter is the fall. Yeah, uh, and so if uh, that's just really a small snippet of. 
And, and really, there are uh, some aspects of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 creation narrative just simply pertaining to God's covenant uh, with His people, and not primarily this big shotgun spread across all humanity. So there is that aspect of it too, but um, that might be a podcast for another day. And even to further that idea of it doesn't take long to get to the fall, um, it is the third chapter, but really it's only the second event. Because uh, you know Genesis one mm-hmm. and two, as we talked about uh, in, first, yeah. in a previous podcast, Genesis mm-hmm. one is uh, you know more a here's the creation account, and then mm-hmm. Genesis two is here's the creation account more zoomed in, and this yeah. is the God that created. So really, it's the second uh, the second thing that happens in the scriptures mm-hmm. is the fall of man. That's good. Yeah, um, it's good. So we're created in the image and likeness of God with creative capabilities. We can't, of course, create out of nothing. And so we use what God has given us to make art, you know, to make music. And that's something that we did not mention when we were discussing the existence of God, some things that that I think are very helpful, too. Uh, and maybe we'll just add these in. Uh, and so humankind in their creative power that God has given to them. They can create things such as music, uh, can create mathematical equations, uh, logic, um, and those type disciplines. But those are things that are not created. Say, I cannot create mathematical probabilities. Yeah, and I They're would, always there. Yeah, and I would even say there. an equation. I mean, that's more of a discovering. That's discovering, than, than, yeah. Than a creating. As far as art is concerned, you know, there's an element of something that's beautiful, something that, um, you know, as, as we can enjoy as uh, something that, that's beautiful as far as a piece of art, or whatever that might be. But when you start moving into stuff like music, notes of music, I, I can hear, you know, a G or a C chord. And I don't have to have a title to that to know that that musical tone exists. Right. And so, uh, but we take what God has already created and we make beautiful music with it. Uh, we make logical syllogisms, A, B, C, premises, therefore. Uh, these are things that we discover uh, because, because God has created, created these things, his principles that are interwoven with in the, in the cosmos or in the universe itself, and we have just simply discovered those things. So that that helps in two ways. That helps that helps us to understand that we are created with uh, in the image of God with creative capabilities, and it also helps us to understand uh, a little something of the existence of God too, who has put these things in order. It, just to uh, kind of switch gears here. I mean, I may be getting ahead of ourselves here. We we may talk about this a little bit mm-hmm. later, but uh, you mentioned Genesis one three right. being the first time we see ex nihilo creation, uh, where God said, "Let there be light." Mm-hmm. Um, talk a little bit about the difference between Genesis one three and Genesis uh, one fourteen through sixteen. I'll read sixteen. It says, uh, "And God made two great lights: the greater light mm-hmm. to rule the day, mm-hmm. and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars." Okay, so the question becomes, how was there light before the illuminaries? Yeah, That's before, really the question. Before the sun and the moon, yeah. All right, so uh, if you fast forward down to the end of the age, the book of the Revelation, it says that in that city, New Jerusalem, uh, there will be no need for the sun or moon or illuminaries because the light will come from the glory of the sun, meaning God, become from the glory of God. Uh, in this case, it's the same with this account. The reason that we have light before the illuminaries is because this is the glory of God in creation. Uh, but that has always been a question um, when you read down, well, you know, especially if you're reading it from a skeptical end or, you know, a um, astrophysics type mentality uh, that uh, why, why are there mentioned illuminaries such as moon, stars, and those type things when there's already been light. Well, up to this point, the glory of God has, that's the light that we see. Yeah, and I think, too, part of the the uh, um, 
creating the the sun and moon um, is also part of just setting the physics of Earth in motion. And you know, we know that those are things that uh, that help determine our weather and um, the movement of the oceans mm-hmm. and tides and such. So um, that that part of creation uh, of putting the sun and, and the moon in place, um, I think I th- just personally think that is. Uh, where God was really setting the mm-hmm. the physics of of how Earth uh, is gonna gonna work, right? Yeah. Okay, so we talked about the two terms uh, that we find in Genesis one. There's two terms that I think helps us to lay some some groundwork uh, for charting out um, something unique that happens. We talked about the glory of God in creation. Uh, via the light, God's glory. Uh, we spoke briefly about bara, which is this uh, unique Hebrew word for uh, creative power that only God can do. Uh, this is not with other things like humankind with other elements can create with their hands. This is ex nihilo. This is a, a creative event that only God can do. But then there's a unique word in there. Uh, the in your English Bible, the third word is actually where we get the title for Genesis from, uh, which is the word they use for beginning or beginnings. And in this particular word, John Selhammer, uh, he charts out what he holds to as a historical creationism, and so there's this big debate over young Earth, old Earth. Uh, something called the gap theory, uh, meaning that between every day there's an indefinite amount of years between day one, day two. So there's a gap theory. Um, There's all these things, all these theories. But I think John Selhammer, I think he helps lay out using just a simple Hebrew text to lay out the probability that in this word beginning, You can have an indefinite amount of years. It can be a thousand years. It could be a million years. It can be a billion years. And yet, after that indefinite time of beginnings, you have six literal days, which I believe he uses the Hebrew to chart this out. So he's using the scripture to do it, but then using the word yom for day for 24 literal days. This is not the gap theory, and so we're not we're not propagating that. In fact, we're not really endorsing either either one or the other. We're simply talking through. Yeah, the gap the gap theory, one. as you said, is uh, in between every single day mm-hmm. you can ascribe x amount of days, weeks, years, whatever. In between, it could be a large amount. Um, the historical creationism is just saying. Uh, it, the beginning, the in the beginning, mm-hmm. is a uh, mm-hmm. uh, immeasurable even amount of time. You know, it can be any, as you said, anything. But um, yeah. when you start with God created, yes. it said, "Let there be light." Then that starts day one, twenty-four mm-hmm. hour day, and then tomorrow is day two. Um, not yeah. a gap in between day There's one, twenty-four and day hour two. yom or days. Yeah. So in, in his book, uh, which I kind of like utilize for this discussion, is Genesis Unbound. This is a classic work. Um, this, this one had recently become available without having a hundred and some dollar price tag on it. Uh, and so this is Genesis Unbound by John Selhammer. Uh, and I'm going to just go ahead and say that he is not purporting a gap theory, and neither are we. We're not espousing any particular view of creation that just God created it. I will say this that the yom that is mentioned for a day are 24 hour days and uh what happened in the beginning we uh, we don't we just don't know those days. We're not given that. Uh, in fact, let me read you a quote from John Selhammer here. He says that um he says I believe Genesis 1 and 2 teach that God created the whole universe during a time which the writer calls the beginning. And then he goes after goes on after that, uh, talking about each twenty four hour day. He says there are no gaps in the creation account of Genesis one, nor is there a recreation or re 
uh, institution of an original creation. So there is no, so you don't, you're not having two creation accounts from Genesis one, chapter one, and Genesis two. And so that, you know, that really it does is not the gap theory at all. Other some folks might think it is. Uh, that is not a an endorsement of the gap theory at all. But I do think there is something to be said about using the Hebrew word, the word, for beginning and saying, in, in, in its understanding of that Hebrew word, it can mean an indefinite amount of years when God said, let there be light in the beginning. Uh, and so that what does that do to young earth, um, which I'm probably more young earth than I am, a, you know, uh, but, you know, I, I, I like to examine the Scripture to see what the the Scripture and the and the languages say. Yeah, you know, like uh, I said at the beginning of the uh, uh, podcast, you like what I, what I did there, the beginning mm-hmm. of the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I definitely, I'm definitely uh, I'm flexible on, on my, my view. I tend to lean more toward a young earth. Mm-hmm. But I just I just think this is one of those things that that God made um, or left unclear in the Bible for a purpose, and sometimes I think uh, the these kind of debates, uh, we, like I said, uh, we will spend a little bit too much time right, on. and it calls tension um, for sure. Yeah, and calls yeah. tension. But uh, I think it's it's kind of unclear for a purpose, mm-hmm. um, and that purpose just may be that we just don't really need to know. Um, yeah, some you know some folks will use the genealogy of you know from Adam on to purport you know that the Earth is six thousand years old or whatever it might be, but that still does not answer the question of beginnings. I have no problem with right. with from from day one on with the young Earth model, right? But the beginnings is yeah. uh, and 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 we're just not not holding to an older Earth, if you will, not. Not particularly millions of years, yeah. but we're not just simply holding to that for the sake of saying we don't want to look dumb in the presence of the scientific community. That's not at all. We're saying, at least that's more reasonable to me because it lines up more with the original, um, the original text. Right. Right. All right. So as we mentioned, we have been brewing uh, really premium uh, blends and brews for beans over the past uh, few weeks. So today we wanted to give more of a practical home use. Uh, This is straight out of off a supermarket um, shelf. Dunkin' Donuts, you can find this in the whole bean or you can actually find it in the grounds or grind it up in the supermarket. You can find that on your shelf. But today we're going to be using the the AeroPress uh, to uh, to brew it with, and uh, Jason's going to grind us up some beans here in a moment. Uh, we're using a grinder, of course, to to uh, grind our beans up. Uh, this particular grinder is about fourteen, fifteen bucks, very cheap, but it does the job. Yeah, this uh, this uh, this particular bag of beans, I don't know that we even know where we got them from. Uh, yeah, they were mm-hmm. in the office this week. So, mm-hmm. if uh, somebody watched and sent them to us, thank you. Uh, not really sure as to say, but we figured since we had them and they were fresh, that's what we'd use this week. And one thing about these Dunkins, um, you know, the premium beans that we've been getting, they are, they are a bit pricey. Uh, Eighteen dollars for a pound of uh, coffee is probably about average for a fresh roasted from a coffee house. Uh, kind of kind of bean, uh, which is not necessarily real practical for your everyday coffee, but uh, these Dunkin' beans really are um, pretty good, and we'll talk a little bit about the the coffee at the end of the episode about the taste. Um, but this is a uh, affordable bean you can get a whole bean coffee in uh, because one of the things about whole bean is you get the full flavor. Um, if you brew your coffee as soon as you grind it. Um, so, and when you get a, a pre-ground coffee from the store, you're gonna miss out on, on a bit of the flavor palette in the bean. Um, and it just is much fresher tasting 
Um, even if it's been a while since it's been roasted, it's still much fresher tasting when, uh, when you uh, brew it as soon as you grind it. So we're going to grind these and let you look at the, the bean just a little bit as I pour it into this grinder. And, uh, and we'll grind these up and use the AeroPress, as Pastor Larry said. Usually when you, we use this kind of uh, grinder, you see the little metal rim in the bottom. We'll get it right about even with the uh, metal rim there. That's close to our three tablespoons that we like to use. And this kind of grinder, you kind of have to uh, probably do it a time or two to get used to your grounds, ground size. Since we're using uh, front, uh, the AeroPress, we want to get it close to a espresso ground, so a really fine, and you just hold it. And I like to give it a little shake while I'm grinding so that it mixes the beans in there and gets a good uh, uniform grind. So kind of a little, little shake, do it for a few seconds, and shake. And then I'll look at it. And, you can kind of listen yeah, too. You can hear it too. Yeah. It's a little bit coarse, so I'll give it just another second or two. And you hear it's making less noise, so it's probably good. Yeah, there we go. Nice fine espresso grind there. And this grinder comes right off, so it's ready to mm -hmm. ready to pour. And all of these um, pieces for this AeroPress, they, you can buy them in a kit. Uh, we have we featured the AeroPress in a previous episode. Yeah, I'm gonna link it again. It's in the link to that mm -hmm. other episode, but I'll put it in this one as well. And so we, now it's ready for uh, all. It's ready. It's ready mm -hmm. for the hot water. And uh, we got coffee mugs as well. If you would like a coffee mug, let us know. We'll get you a coffee mug. As Jason is adding the water, what you want to do, of course, uh, just as we did with the previous episode, is to just plunge that on down. Um, and yeah, you know, this is the single cut, of course. Yeah, I mentioned in the last, the last episode where we used the AeroPress. The AeroPress is kind of a premium version of the K-Cup mm -hmm. as far as getting a single cup of coffee. I, know the, I think the thing that really made the K-Cups take off is there are a lot of households where there's just one person that drinks coffee. Mm -hmm. And it's not practical to brew a full pot of coffee. And it's quick. And, and it's quick. <laughs> and so I think, you know, I still use a K-Cup in the morning mainly because it's quick and... I'm not really a morning person, so getting up and doing this first thing before I'm awake good is just mm -hmm. not going to consistently happen. Yeah, so, I find myself sometimes with um, with the with the AeroPress, I'll get my stuff ready that night. Yeah. So when I get up in the morning, I just hit the kettle, and and then it's right there. And, um, it, it still is simpler to throw a little cup in yeah. the first thing. All right. Well, that is the the Duncans. We'll sample that here in a moment, and we'll give you a review at the end of the podcast. Genesis one and Genesis two. That is chapters one and two in the book of Genesis. It is probably one of the most debated and controversial portions of the Bible, especially when you're talking about origins of the earth and universe. Uh, that being in opposition to a more evolutionary process uh, of origins, uh, not only of, of the earth and the universe, but also of humankind as well. So Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, as you might know, has come under scrutiny over the last at least 50, 50 years or so, if not, if not more than that. Especially if you go if you go all the way back to when evolution, uh, Charles Darwin uh, introduced this evolutionary idea and the origin of uh, origin of man or the uh, origin of species idea of evolution, and uh, at some regard, red flags went up, and uh, the church uh, Christians were up in arms about the evolutionary this process that Darwin was purporting. So Genesis 1 and 2 came under much fire. All right, so as we mentioned in previous portions of podcast and already mentioned, 
that Genesis chapter 1 is the creative power and narrative of God creating an overall creative process. In fact, uh, a little exercise for you is to, uh, we're not going to do that here, but something that you can do is, is open up your Bible, whether you have an electronic version or hard copy, and just read through Genesis chapter 1 and count how many times, just, just note how many times the word for God is used in it. And I, and I believe as you come to the end of that count, I'm not going to tell you how many times it's mentioned, because I know how many times it's mentioned, you'll come to the conclusion that the creation account is not even primarily about creation. It's about God. Yeah. It's about God. And so, so do that as an exercise. So Genesis 1, chapter 1, is this overview of, of creation where God had moved things and created the earth and, and light and created the luminaries and those things in heaven and dry land, and, and God made man, um, as we find all the way down to verse beginning at verse 26 and 27. And this is kind of like this general overview of creation. But then there are some folks that would say, well, Genesis, there's two creation accounts. There's Genesis chapter 1, and then there's Genesis chapter 2, this, uh, this creation account there. Um, have you ever come into any, any folks that would say to you that uh, this is a separate or a different account altogether? I've never had anybody say or, or ask me if it was a different account. I have had people ask uh, why mm-hmm. why is there uh, two tellings yeah. uh, of the the account of, of creation mm-hmm. and I think we've answered that already um, yeah. in a previous <clears throat> podcast when we talked just about the uh, God mm-hmm. and uh, and the nature of God we we talked a little bit about uh, Elohim and Yahweh and and how and we, I've mentioned it already in this podcast uh, mm-hmm. how Genesis 1 is that broad uh, creation event you know we, we, we talked about how when you come to the scriptures um, the scriptures kind of have a presupposition of the reader mm-hmm. already knows and acknowledges that God exists and Genesis 1 is saying okay God created you know God exists God created here's how he created and then Genesis 2 is much more personal um, yeah, it talks right. about uh you know, who the man and woman that were created, who they who they are, and mm-hmm. um, it talks about who mm-hmm. God is. So it's more focusing in and saying, okay, this God that we just told you about in chapter one. Um, now let me tell you who God is. He's Yahweh. Mm-hmm. Um, he is the I Am, uh, the one that we find out about as we move forward throughout right. the Scripture. That's good. Uh, we, we had talked about in previous podcasts about the character of God in two different ways, his transcendency above creation and his eminence. Yeah. And try to think of Genesis chapter 1 and 2 in that way. Chapter 1 is about God's transcendency, his, ma- his majesty over creation, creation and then chapter 2 is his eminence uh, that not only has he created um, everything, but he's created man, and now he wants to be, he wants to have a relationship with that creation, with man. So it's transcendency, chapter one, and eminence, God's nearness in chapter two, as well as the fine details that we find. Genesis one is the is the overall um, glasses if you will, the look into it in chapter two is the microscope. Yeah. All right. So let's, uh, let's talk about maybe some things that might be a stumbling block for, uh, for Christ followers. Uh, what if you came across a person that was, let's say a Christian, you know, they, they have foundational beliefs in the person and work of Jesus. They believe Jesus died on the cross and that he rose again on the third day. Historically, uh, he had a bodily resurrection, but then uh, the question of creation comes up, and they believe in an evolution. 
And all of a sudden, you begin to question their, their faith. And, and I've met folks who do that, who, if a person says, I believe in evolution, that, you know, their, their salvation comes into question. And I really don't think that's entirely fair all the way around. But I think when we talk about evolution, we have to define exactly what we mean when we're talking about evolution and to what scale. Yeah, and... And I think, too, depending on what they mean by that is important. Mm -hmm. Creation and and how we view creation, I don't know if I would put it on a first-order doctrine, um, but it certainly would be second-order. And uh, it could go into the first order, depending on what they mean by that. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if if they mean that how we came to be is completely apart from God, I I think that's going to be bordering on first order, but I've met some people who would say God had his hand, <clears throat> had his hand in uh, evolution and, and, mm-hmm. and had his hand up, upon the whole process, but he used evolution to right. get us where we are. And, and I think that there, that could kind of fall into the second order yeah. um, where, where maybe you wouldn't question their salvation. Um, but certainly it would, it would be, uh, uh, I, I would disagree and, and think that yeah. is is very problematic, yeah. uh, because you're you're. It just seems like that that line of thinking you're taking, trying to take uh, some of God's uh, majesty, mm-hmm. and, and it's almost like you said earlier. We're not trying to sound uh, smart for the uh, skeptic community, <laughs> and it almost if, yeah. um, that almost feels like um, you're kind of. Uh, Leaning into that, well, I don't want to sound dumb. Yeah, I don't want to. You mm-hmm. know, the, the accepted uh, scientific um, idea right. is the Earth is billions of years old, and I'm trying to reconcile mm-hmm. Scripture with that. And, and I, I think you can do that in a scholarly right. way um, without just saying, "Hey, okay, so God used um, this assumption that um, the skeptic community has um, to try to marry those two ideas," right. and you just don't have to do that. Yeah, and we actually end up falling into the fallacy of appeal to authority when we when we end up doing that, and it, it becomes a logical fallacy at that point for a Christ follower to 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 try to do that, um, to you know not to look dumb or appeal to science. Uh, again, science has its place, and 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 we are advocates of science, but yeah. we would also say we're advocates of good. Good yeah. science, and I think too on the other side of that coin, um, you know, I've met folks, and you know, from time to time, I may have even fallen into this myself. When you hear a term like evolution, mm-hmm. that the church uh, has kind of historically, or at least mm-hmm. historically recently, um, attributed to being anti-gospel, and just completely closing off to any ideas mm-hmm. of that. Cause we'll talk about in a minute, you know, the difference between micro right. and macro evolution and, uh, and how some of that mm-hmm. is, is perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, you know, we, we shouldn't fall into that danger of when we hear a word that's supposed to be not accepted, um, in Christendom, if you will, that we won't hear anything, um, anything to do with it. Uh, we want to kind of use logic through all ideas and come to what the scripture supports logically. We'll talk about that in a moment. Right. So, yeah, macro and micro evolution. Uh, these are not new topics, by the way. This is an age old debate, an age old conversation that has happened. Just really short micro evolution is the, let's say we have, let's take a dog, for instance. And from a dog, you have different canines, such as, you know, a coyote or. Uh, you know, or hyena or something that comes from that. And the Bible calls these kinds. Uh, in, in fact, let's just read just, just a snippet of this idea. And, and God said, let the earth bring forth creatures according to their kinds. So this would be the microevolutionary um, idea, the livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And so uh, instead of species there, we would use the word kinds. That is this microevolution amongst different kinds. So, such as like when you're talking about the uh, the equestrian, uh, you know, or equine or whatever horses, uh, like zebras and so those those type things. 
Uh, but when you talk about macro, you're talking, this is where we have the problem, where you have things evolving with different genetic DNA information altogether, uh, where you would find, you know, the, the problem with this is when it goes to origins, that we, reasoning people, have my, macro evolved from some primordial ooze. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, so macro is huge changes, micro mm-hmm. is small. And we don't have a, a really a problem with micro. And that's what I was getting at. Like, don't hear the word evolution, and then we talk, start talking about mm-hmm. microevolution. And so, well, they're heretical. They believe evolution. Yeah, yeah. But you know what I'm saying? Like, microevolution, uh, and it, where, where you've got here is well documented, um, happens every day. And that's um, yeah. where something's corrupted or lost. Um, that That's, you know, it's, it's kind of micro almost tends to kind of go down. Heal, but macro would s- mm-hmm. say the opposite. That is, yeah, uh, you know, we went, we came from a, li- a little single ooze, nothing mm-hmm. to a complex organism to a, yeah. a person. Those are kind of two things that yeah. really don't make sense in the evolutionary. Yeah. The macro evolutionary process doesn't make much sense because um, yeah. you're, you're having almost this something coming from a billion year span. And a whole brand new species. But the other idea is this adaptation uh, that species adapt to yeah. their environment, that which don't make much sense because um, it, it, at some point, millions of years ago, this inability to adapt would have led to their demise. Right. So even if you follow this, this uh, species adaptation idea, uh, you have a deterioration. You can't even get to the point of an adapted species to its environment. Uh, you think of like the duckbill platypus or uh, a toucan, you know, or something like that has adapted certain things for its environment. Rather, what we would say is that God created them with those abilities to sustain in their environment. Right. And there has been a few uh, attempts from you know, different uh, naturalists in terms of following a fossil trail, I, I remember this this one key word in kind of uh, learning about evolution and giving a defense for creation was this idea of transitional fossil records that you can't chart it. You yeah, know. they always had the missing link. Yeah, the missing link. Yeah. Uh, you know, and we're you know we're not trying to well, they go found, into. <laughs> they found the missing link. They made a movie about it in the. Uh-huh. I think it was early nineties Encino man, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or they would reconstruct Lucy, so, which is, yeah. uh, you know, with reconstruct this whole skeleton out of a pig tooth. So, I mean, yeah. it, it's all what you kind of want to, to believe and pre- to project. Um, and so, so there are some different views of creation, uh, creationism and evolution that have kind of merged and a, and a good resource for that. If you want to learn more about creation and evolution, the, this is three views of creation and evolution. And so the chapter talks about those three being young earth creationism, uh, which is six literal days of creation and the earth being six to 10,000 years old. There is a more progressive creationism, this old earth creationism, which is more leaning towards the historical creation account, using the word beginnings as an indefinite amount of years. And then there is this theistic evolutionary uh, idea, which is uh, called the the full gifted uh, creation. And this is a book uh, who has Paul Nelson, Robert Newman, and Howard Van Til, who are contributing to each of these ideals. Uh, this is three views on creation and evolution, and the uh, the link will be in the description uh, for this particular volume. Very helpful to kind of help articulate these three different views uh, of creation and evolution. And these are taken from a theistic uh, worldview, obviously, but the uh, the the last the latter one, which is a theistic evolutionary idea, is a merging of uh, of of naturalistic evolution and creation together, which I would say that that would, um, I I would kind of hold some red flags up on that one. Yeah. Uh, We don't, we don't obviously endorse that. And like I said uh, before, you know, that's kind of blurs the line. I think 
between your doctrinal orders. Um, I think somebody could hold to a, a naturalistic view with God's hand in it and and still believe in the lordship of Christ and all that. But I, I do think that as someone matures in their faith mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and start to understand uh, who God is and God's power and um, and and would see that, that that idea is taking away from God's majesty, and that's one of the one of the dangers of um, of falling into um, the idea of evolution mm-hmm. um, is you know ascribing uh, less power and majesty to God um, to really to satisfy um, the skeptical. Um, yeah, ideas. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's one danger. Another danger, you know, when you start talking about um, ideas purported by evolution is survival of the fittest. Um, and we can look all throughout the course of history and see how mm-hmm. that uh, that mindset is just uh, is detrimental mm-hmm. to society. Um, obviously, it's uh, it doesn't line up with Scripture. You know, if you read Scripture, you see how God <laughs> likes to use um, really, the the opposite of the fittest, if you will, um, to accomplish his purpose. Uh, the mm-hmm. the nation of Israel was a small, mm-hmm. um, in, inconsequ- inconsequential um, people, and he used that nation, that people, to redeem mankind. Um, everything about Christ seems to be uh, the least thing you would think of to be um, to be majestic. I mean, born in a manger. Um, Born in, into, uh, um, well, born in a manger, born in, in <laughs> Bethlehem, a small mm-hmm, town mm-hmm. Um, that, uh, that nobody would know right. about if Christ wasn't right. born there, um, those sort of things. But talk about maybe some historical things that have happened um, where this idea of right. survival of the <clears throat> fittest has just been really damaging mm-hmm. to society. So uh, h- history has... Uh, we we grab a hold on to to things and ideals, and sometimes we don't even really realize we have incorporated them into our practical lives. Uh, Frederick Nietzsche is one of those uh, who had had taken this evolutionary idea of there being a Superman, uh, this superior person, superior race of people, and this idea, of course, uh, had influenced uh, Nazi Germany, uh, Adolf Hitler, and the idea of a perfect person, perfect man, an Aryan, an Aryan race, uh, which would have consisted of blonde hair, blue eyes, white skin, that kind, of, that kind of idea. And as a result of this idea of a Superman, which is the idea of the survival of the fittest, we find things in history, awful things, such as the Holocaust, and so we have to be careful when we're talking about this evolutionary uh, idea because there are certain ideas that come with it that if we're not careful, especially for our theistic evolution, uh, evolutionary friends, uh, that uh, there are certain ideas that we do not need to affirm. And one of them is the survival of the fittest. Uh, six to ten million uh, people you know, in the Jewish you know, the Jewish community died because of this idea of the survival of the fittest. And uh, just we have to be careful of holding on to, to these ideas. Um, and one thing that it does, in fact, uh, harm is the imago Dei, the image of God. Uh, survival of the fittest today, if it was alive, if you will, in our culture, which it is, would be the taking of an innocent life. And what I mean by that is, uh, let's say... You know, a husband and wife get the diagnosis that their ch- the child in the womb uh, is uh, is handicapped or will be, you know, uh, Down syndrome or something like that. Society, if you follow the course of survival of the fittest, would say, well, those children, you know, in the womb would would need to be aborted or something horrible like that, or older folks who uh, have the inability to look after themselves. Uh, those are harmful ideas if we adapt this survival of the fittest um, philosophy. Yeah, and just to kind of further that, uh, you know, somebody may hear hear those statements and say, "Well, um, I can hold to survival of the fittest, but and, and I would never do that." Mm. And you know that may be the case, but uh, th- just those thought processes 
and those ideas um, lead to that for for many people, and and that's what makes those dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so again, um, just as we um, we endorse scripture first. That's the yeah. that's our primary source is scripture. So don't 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 think that we have taken a liberal stance on creation at all. In fact, I think we've taken a more biblical stance yeah. um, than just um, being what you've always been taught. Right. And uh, so we've we're taking actually a more biblical stance on creation. Uh, but there is, I think, there is a danger, just as we mentioned last week about the King James only. There is a danger of of holding, idolizing a young Earth um, mode of creation, or even an evolutionary. There is idolatry can be v- right. found even in that. Right, and I mentioned a couple of times, you know, that time in my life where. I just came to the point of wanting to really mm-hmm. understand why I believe what I believe. And I think yeah. going forward through this podcast, we're just that's kind of going to be a theme of um, letting go of oh, what yeah. we've always known and uh-huh. always believed and really um, examining those ideas with scripture. Right. And and that's, you know, that's what we want to do. And sometimes scripture will uh, su- support you know what we've always been taught. Hopefully, mm-hmm. we'll find that more than than we want. But sometimes, mm-hmm. scripture may may support something a little different, and that's okay. Yeah. We want to we want to line up with God's truth, and not with uh, think, not with right. any kind of cultural right. truth, mm-hmm. whether that be some cultural truth that has crept its way into the church over the years that uh, that doesn't line up with scripture. Mm-hmm. Um, we just we want to be uh, true to to God's truth, mm-hmm. um, which is in in essence really the only truth. Right. So in closing, uh, what does this mean for the church? Uh, well, as we have purport, purported that we believe that God's created everything out of nothing for the purpose of His glory, the purpose of redeeming humanity through the person and work of Jesus. So creation, even creation itself, if you were to read the prologue of John, it shows that Jesus is the very reason for creation. Yeah. And so that's what we purport as we talk about creation, that it all points to Christ. But there are, of course, some congregations, some local congregations that hold certain covenants and creeds that if you were to be a member of that church, you would have to sign a covenant that would say that you hold to a young earth or that you would hold to a, uh, let's say, a certain eschatology that you got. You have to believe there's a pre-trib rapture or those type things. And, and my word of warning to that would be, um, you know, that those are items that lead to further discussion and not, are not particularly first-order doctrine. Yeah. I, mean, I would be careful I mean, It's that. just dangerous to, mm-hmm. uh, to ascribe church membership yeah. to that because mm-hmm. really that and they may not have that this this line of thinking but it at least uh, seems to attach uh, if not salvation at least spiritual maturity to uh, mm. to, to those ideas and I, yeah, I know right. plenty of people who I would consider very uh, spiritually mature mm-hmm. that are young earth and then mm-hmm. some who are uh, you know, older earth. Right. So um, I think it's just yeah. dangerous to uh, attach um, that kind of uh, importance to uh, to something right. that is, I mean, just as we've already said, biblically mm-hmm. unclear. Yeah, I, my position has changed over the years on certain things. Uh, I think I matured as far as I hope I have matured in in thinking about creation and end time events, which by the time we get to speaking of eschatology, we would have charted a whole lot of different theological topics. And uh, I would just say that um, our views that are not particularly first order are always evolving to some point, yeah. hopefully growing. Uh, so we'll, we'll end on that today. Uh, the Dunkin' Donuts coffee, um, this is a, a staple. If we were to review our coffee, uh, I drink uh, I drink the Dunkin's Dunkin' Donuts brew um, 
quite a bit. Uh, it is a good um, house blend coffee. Um, you know, it's very smooth. It's a good supermarket coffee. Yeah, good. Yeah. It's probably one of the best ones you can get off the shelf uh, as far as going into your regular supermarket, which is that, that this episode is really for practicality, uh, you know, um, and you can also buy those in a K-cup, you know, yeah. the Dunkin' Donuts. The, the Dunkin' K-cup uh, is definitely, is not my favorite. Um, I, I actually, I hate to endorse a particular <laughs> uh, chain, so right. I'm not going to say which one is my favorite. But my favorite uh, is a store brand, brand Colombian for a K cup, because yeah. you, you're not getting freshness out of yeah, a K cup. Yeah. But uh, mm. um, my favorite whole bean <laughs> supermarket is probably uh, Dunkin'. Um, it it has like a a, um, a house blend kind of taste. It really reminds me of uh, of like a Waffle House coffee. If you go there when right. they just brewed it, now right. I know Waffle House you get can get some really really old stale coffee <laughs> that's been there all day. Yeah. But uh, if you go there and they brew it fresh, it's a, you know it's a good cup. And uh, Duncan kind of reminds me of that a good medium uh, blended roast uh, that that will be sufficient for your everyday mm -hmm. uh, grind it up and brew it coffee. Um, you know, we love to order specialty stuff from time to time, but that's not, uh, that's, you know, just not uh, economically sustainable to do for your everyday all the time right. cup of coffee. And I think Duncan is a great one for that. I would give it a three bean out of five uh, rating right. just for a, a cup of coffee. Right. I'd, I'd probably go with closer to a four. Um, just because I drink it regularly. Um, speaking of specialty coffees, what are we looking at for for next? Uh, well, I have uh, ordered um, some some beans from Anchor Coffee, uh, which is out of Western North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, I have a friend mm -hmm. who uh, works with those guys. Um, Gary is uh, with uh, Anchor Coffee, and we have some people from our church who are from. Um, from that area or live in that area now mm -hmm. um, that I have seen on social media post stuff about anchor before. So a okay. um, couple of little connections with them okay. and uh, they, you know, they are a, a good, um, good coffee roasting company. We want to review next week. Mm -hmm. I'll, I won't mm -hmm. say any more about them. We'll save that for, right. for the next okay. episode, okay. but uh, anchor, we're going to be drinking their Ethiopian, Ethiopian bean. So mm -hmm. I look forward to that. Yeah. Good. So preview of next week, Anchor Coffee. Uh, next week's topic will be on the agents of God. In this particular case, will be angels. Uh, ought to be an interesting topic. Uh, uh, one, another one of those topics that um, a lot of misconceptions about, uh, you might call it angelology. I don't know what you want to call it, but uh, we're going to be studying about uh, angels angels. And uh, that will be next week. Hope you'll tune in. Hope you'll tune in for that. Yeah, check us out on Facebook. Like us on Facebook. Or, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, Caffeinated Theology Podcast. You should be able to find us on, um, on Facebook. Any closing remarks? Yeah. Uh, you know, if you, I don't, we don't know exactly how everybody's been listening to us or watching us. We're on YouTube. Uh, also on uh, um Podbean, which gets uh, um, linked over to Spotify, and that's through uh, for, for right now at least is through uh, Piney Grove Baptist Church. Um, it's it's on that uh, that feed. But uh, if you are watching us on YouTube and maybe you want to listen while you're driving, Podbean or Spotify are good for that. Um, if you've been listening to us in that uh, avenue and you want to um, see the video that goes along with it, that's on YouTube. Um, you can search all those caffeinated theology um, or caffeinated theology one. Um, it comes up both ways. And uh, we have an email caffeinated, caffeinated theology one at gmail.com. You can always send any questions or comments um, there. Uh, we appreciate any comments um, on the, on any of the platforms. They help to uh, um, get the podcast uh, uh, put out there. Anytime somebody comments, it's more likely to pop up in a, recommended for other people right. uh, so that's the yeah. way you can support us and 
Uh, we're still toying around with different ideas. Uh, today, as you see, we're in a, a a new studio, if you will, that we're setting up. Uh, um, different, a little bit different format. Uh, so we're still kind of building, uh, building what we're doing here, and um, hopefully we'll be able to continue to improve. And so far, I've enjoyed uh, doing these podcasts. Yeah, I have too. Yep. So I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Uh, look for us next week. Uh, we talk about angels and drink some anchor coffee. God bless you. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us. And we hope today's discussion has encouraged and challenged you. Please join us again next week as we discuss biblical truths over a fine cup of coffee.